in another session is great. This will build upon that. Um, if you haven't been in the other sessions, no problem. This is also standalone, so we're excited. Um, we'll put in the chat here the presentation slides if you want access to those. So we're gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves. Um, I'll start in Colleen Stam. I'm the math and science coordinator for Farmington Public Schools, a former math and science middle school teacher. And I have a Tetris high score champion somewhere out there, maybe. Maybe it's still there. All right. Hi, I'm Desiree Harrison, and um, I'm an instructional, an elementary instructional coach if, with Farmington. I'm um, on the board of directors for NCTM, and I've never been stung by a bee. And hi, I'm Carrie Heaney. Um, I am a secondary math coach and a math interventionist with Farmington Public Schools, and I can name that song in three notes. All right. So the objective of our session today is to deepen is deepening awareness of what all students bring to the math classroom and how this impacts instruction. So really, um, how do we find out who our kids are and how do we use that to help teach math to our students? So this is going to be an interactive session. So you're going to need some pencil and paper for this. And then we're also going to have some breakout rooms later, uh, just so you know, because I know some of you might be somewhere where it might not be so easy to get pencil and paper. But if you are somewhere, get some pencil and paper out right now, because uh, you're going to need it. Uh, no calculators on this. So uh, in a moment, you're going to have one minute to answer some questions. So we're gonna show you some questions and you will have one minute. All right, give you a couple more seconds to get yourself ready. Okay, on your mark, get set and go. All right, three, two, one. You're gonna stop now. So stop where you're at now. Is anyone else feeling this way right now? Anyone else is heart racing a little bit, especially when you got to maybe that bottom row. So these time tests, can cause a lot of anxiety. So this is a time test. Now the first row, the first couple rows might've been like, oh, I got this. And then you get to 78 times three, and then you get to 90 times 32. So these questions at the bottom are typically not found on a time test that we find in a lot of classrooms, which usually occurs in like third and fourth grade, maybe in second and first, if you're doing addition, subtraction facts. But we put those down there on purpose because though the way you were feeling on those, that time crunch, is probably how students are feeling with the top row. Because it takes them some time in when in third and fourth grade when they're trying to retrieve this data or or think through it in their brain. So we purposely put those ones in the body, even though you probably wouldn't find them on a time test, just so you could get a feeling of what your students might be feeling. So there's a lot of research out there about time tests, especially from Joe Bowler and uh, Jennifer Bay Williams and Gina Kling. And they found that even students who perform well on time tests, so those that, that do well and, and get within the time, share concerns such as I feel nervous and I know my facts, but this scares me. Remember, this is students that did well. So some things to think about. 
Do we want children to feel this way? And how would feeling this way, so think about how you just felt taking that, how would this affect your identity, especially in the mathematics classroom or in a mathematics lesson? So we're gonna take some time to think about these because these are pretty common um, in classrooms still. And not, and I, I want to say this is not to the fault of teachers. Some teachers, we just don't know any better. We, I experienced this. I remember the anxiety of a second grader going through this. It's, it was a real thing that most of us experienced in our classrooms. So let's think about how does this prove student learning? If you look in the Common Core, when you look up fluency, which is our, our facts, it's not just about being efficient or being quick. Some people equate those as being the same thing. The Common Core says to be fluent, we have to be flexible in our strategies. We have to be accurate. We have to be efficient and we have to be appropriate. So thinking about those four things, how could we adjust a time test like this in order for students to um, prove their learning? around fluency, around those four things. So an example might be, I'm gonna take seven times eight, just that question. I'm gonna give that to my students and I'm gonna say, prove or show me how many different ways you can solve seven times eight. And maybe there's a little bit of a time limit on it, but everybody within that time limit should be able to come up with at least one way to show how you can solve seven times eight. And then that allows my students who know it quickly to come up with more ways. How can I show seven times eight and what that equals? So we're gonna put you in breakout rooms here for about 10 minutes and think about what are some ways I could take the same time test and use it as a place to get more information about my students for them to prove their learning, to prove they're fluent, prove that they can do it accurately, they can do it efficiently, they can do it flexibly and appropriately. How, how could I adjust this test to show that? So we're gonna go ahead and take 10 minutes. To talk okay, so once again, you'll be in groups of uh, four or five. Uh, make sure that you accept the breakout room invitation when you see it. Um, I will be posting uh, the prompt um, in the, uh, in the in, into the room once you get in there. But for those who just joined us, um, the prompt was, um, you know, how could you use a, 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 an experience like this, a test like this, to find out more about student learning? How can you use it that way? Did I, did I phrase that right, Colleen? Yeah, how could I adapt it? How could I change how, it up and still get some student learning out, but take that anxiety of the time out? You got it. All right. And so you will be uh, leaving my uh, presence in three, two, one. All right. And they're all yours. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Do we have a group or two that would like to share? You can either put it in the chat, something from that, that you would adapt, or if you want to unmute and share. So if you could just share something that you've talked about in your breakout room. Um, I can share something that I talked Someone in my group mentioned how they still timed it, but they did it differently. So instead of saying like everybody has, you know, five minutes to do this time test, they had the students time themselves on how long they took and had them like see how they improved. So instead of feeling like you have to get it done in this time, they were saying, okay, this is how long you took. Let's see if maybe you can be get a little bit faster next time. So instead of rushing them, it was just trying to improve on them on themselves. And they're just really competing against themselves, right? Like you said, it's just growth for how you're personally growing. Do a couple people say you could do fewer problems, shared some math fact games. Yes, math fact games are a great one that they can play and still get that chance to practice, but in a game-like environment. Keeping it fun and game-based, less stakes, yes. Celebrating different ways to solve the problems and find patterns, yes. I actually had to have a similar conversation with my own child's teacher because 
they were doing 12 times 10 and she could tell me 10 times 10, two times 10, and then put those together to get 12 times 10. And it was, I'm sorry, it's 12 times 12. So 10 times two and, um, sorry, 10 times 12 and two times 12 from the other. It took a little bit longer than the time test allowed for it. But I said, think about that strategy. That's a great strategy. Being an upper, a middle school math teacher, that's distributive property. So yes, thinking about those different ways to solve the problems. Anyone else like to share? Start timing with fewer problems. All right, these are, these are some good ideas, a good start. Ways that we can help bring that anxiety down to help our students um, think about their math identities. I'll share. Oh, go ahead, Jeffrey. Okay, um, well, my group talked about, um, I, I mentioned like 99 math, which is kind of different. Anyone's ever played Kahoot, gets a lot of fun. Um, where the students are, I actually have my students get privacy folders and they play on their laptops and they, so there's a, um, I'll start the game and there's a code and then they can, it is a flashcard kind of a thing, but I told the students, we're just having fun. Nobody needs to know your score. Just do your best, just have fun with it and just go with it. And um, so what it'll do is it'll give a class average on the, on the smart board. Um, so we'll look at the class average. I'm like, okay, guys, let's try it again. Let's do what you guys want to do another round. Yeah, let's do another round. And um, it will give like the like the top scores and then we'll, we'll play another round. And I said, if you're not a top scorer now, don't worry about it. Just have some fun with it. Let's go with it. So they enjoyed that. And even my students who really struggle with multiplication bass, they do ask to play that. Um, and then um, someone else in our group had mentioned um, playing a uh, salute, which I just learned about this in, a, in another PD that I took. But um, if, if you're not familiar with it, so it's um, they, the three people in our group, right? And I don't know if my, my uh, colleague from that group wants to speak up. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. So um, it's Lisa, yeah. So um, anyways, they, then um, you know the, the two uh, players would hold up their cards and then the um, third person, Lisa, I'm not sure. I forgot you gave me the, the proper, can you want to jump in here? Because I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> so ahead. yeah, so you, have, you have three people and you distribute cards and they're holding the card, but they can't see what's on their card, but they look at their partner and then the third person um, calls the product. So if somebody calls like 56 and my partner has eight, then I know I have seven. And whoever says the math, fa the, the fact first, then they get the card. And then you just pass the deck and then they rotate around. My students, it's just a fun, easy game to play. Yeah, that's it. I, I, I was calling heads up, but it's salute. Um, yeah, same thing. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just, and that's something I want to try with my, my sixth graders. Um, something else I've done with my Math 180 kids, um, the intervention students, is um, I have all the, um, the math facts 1 to 44, and then um, they have to shuffle them. They work in teams, and I'll say, you know, shut up, find, find the multiples of eight. And we talk, we, part of the game, we talk about strategies. Like if, you're, if you don't know your eight facts, can you use 10 as a friendly number, jump 10, subtract two? So um, they'll, as a team, they lay out, they go through the cards, and they, um, they find the multiples of eight, eight times one through eight times 12. The first team to finish, um, you know, they'll get some candy, but then, you know, the other teams have to finish up. Then the team, if I see a very strong team, I'll have them like maybe sit out around to give the other students a chance, try to mix up the teams a little bit. They're learning from each other, you know, it's, it's communication, collaboration. So they're they're working together as a team. So that's fun too. And it's got them up and moving around as well. So um, just some strategies. And <clears throat> I mean, we, we also allow them to use their multiplication chart. I, I print out, I printed out um, a half by 11 sheets of paper with a multiplication chart, they're all numbered. So they go into the binder, they look up their number and they pull their multiplication chart. So I do think that's that's another strategy that kind of eases their anxiety as well. So, so okay, I'm done. <laughs> yes, yes, no, and, and I thanks for sharing those games. I mean, those games are great for all grade levels. Like you said, Jennifer, I think you said you teach sixth grade. They can play salute in sixth grade. You can play salute in first grade with some addition facts instead of multiplying. So, right. it, and it works. I had done it with my eighth graders. So it, it can go in all grade levels. Thank you. Welcome. Anyone else? Okay, then I think we're gonna move on to the next section here. Okay, so, um, so thinking about these time tests, and um, you know what we're experiencing in our classrooms. I just have a question for you. I want you to think about. So, 
what percentage of Americans do you think experience math anxiety? So thinking about this question to yourself, what percentage of Americans do you think experience math anxiety? And we're gonna define math anxiety as that panic or helplessness or maybe some paralysis and mental disorganization that comes when you're required to solve a math problem. So I am 30%, 45%, is it just 10%? Um, what are we thinking? I'll give you just a second to... to, to... Do you want to drop it in the chat? Oh, sure, yeah. Oh, look at that, lots of range. All right, so, ooh, yep. All right, 30%, 50. So we've got quite the range here. We're going from, from low to high. This is great, 100%. Oh, that's an interesting one. I like that though. You know, statistically you want to say 100% is not an option, but then you can think about what math anxiety is and you're like, oh, maybe it is 100% um, when we think about it. So here is the actual stat. Sorry, I keep clicking the wrong button on my screen. Approximately 93% of Americans indicate that they have experienced some level of math anxiety. So, you know, so 100% wasn't necessarily off there, right? And, and that says a lot because if 93% of Americans indicate that they've experienced some level of math anxiety, going back to um, the comment earlier about time test and students who even did well on the time test still didn't like it, this ties into that. If 93% of Americans are saying they've experienced math anxiety, then people who are good at math are also saying they're experiencing um, math anxiety. So, um, thinking about this on, on a little bit of a, a continued layer, you know, if you're trying to learn something and you're experiencing math anxiety, um, it's going to impact the way you process information. So, um, you know, and the effects of math anxiety are physical, they're emotional, and they're cognitive. Um, some of our physical ways that, that math anxiety can impact us is an upset stomach, sweaty palms, increased heart rate lightheadedness. I mean, I think a lot of us maybe had that increased heart rate during that time test when we were getting close to the end. You know, emotionally, um, you've got some apprehension, some worry, some tension. Um, I think of the middle school students that I work with, and they don't need anything else to go on emotional. They're going through so much already as it is, right? So add this layer, it's a little bit much. Um, but even cognitively, like um, cognitively, students have trouble accessing working memory. And when you think about how we, we engage with math and a lot of the problems that we actually solve, there are layers to those problems and things that we have to be able to access in the moment to make sense of them. And if I'm experiencing math anxiety and it's actually impacting my ability to access my working memory, it's making that problem harder to solve. Um, so if just kind of thinking about this right now, if this is how you feel in your math class or how you feel when you're doing math, how can you effectively communicate the mathematical brilliance and thinking that exists inside of you, right? So just something we're thinking about. All right. So, um, and I keep looking at this girl and I just keep thinking like, you know, if we're feeling anxiety right now, if you were to stop right now and just check in on some anxiety, how would that be impacting the learning that you're doing in this moment? Is that gonna make it easier, harder? You know, what are those things? Um, and continuing with all this, another fact to consider here is this one. Math anxiety has been recorded in children as young as five. So thinking about this, 93% of students are, report, uh, are excuse me, 93% of Americans have reported math anxiety and kids as young as five have experienced it. So we're thinking about that information. Now, it's not hard to imagine um, at all that when students have the opportunity to connect and build their understanding of themselves as mathematicians, they often don't. Um, you know, they aren't interested in seeing themselves as somebody who engages something that, that brings such a negative feeling to themselves. Um, they identify as non-math. Um, they don't connect their future interests with mathematics. Again, why would I connect with this? This is something that's creating 
on moments where I don't feel good about, about things. Um, and the, and the, the thing for me that's the hardest is that because of this, students also don't see the moments when their mathematical brilliance shines. If you're feeling anxious about math, even when you're doing great things, you often aren't willing to accept it. You aren't willing to see it. You can't see um, the mathematical brilliance that is within yourself. So thinking about that, and then I wanna switch now to a bit of a student role. Um, what message do students get about their role as a math learner? So when you think about them, what, when students leave your room, what, you know, excuse me, or any room, not just yours, what do they think about their role as a math learner? Do they believe that their job as a math learner is to be a calculator, that the purpose of math is to just do some calculations and get the answer? Or do they see themselves as a thinker and a problem solver? Do they see that as a mathematics student, that is about thinking, that's about making connections and that that is about um, looking at a problem and thinking about it in a different way. Um, you know, which one, which one do they see? How do they think they're supposed to be when we, they think about a math learner? So if the goal for teaching, learning and, for teaching and learning mathematics is to develop, ugh, to develop student abilities to use mathematics as they make sense of, question, and create a better world, if that's what we want for our students, the question is, which role should we emphasize? The calculator or the thinker? I think you guys know which one I'm gonna say. The thinker, right? So. Thinking about all of that information and the learner we've just been talking, that I've been talking about and that you've been thinking about, I wanna give you the chance to reflect on some of the different practices that are happening um, in your classroom, at your grade level, at your course level maybe in your department or even in your building. So thinking about those practices. And when I say practices, I'm thinking about all the different things we do in our classrooms when we're learning mathematics. So you're gonna go into a breakout room right now. And um, in that breakout room, you are going to um, have the opportunity to discuss some of these practices. Um, yeah, you're going to have the, the opportunity to discuss some of these practices and talk about them. Mark, I agree. Um, you know, I, people will often ask me where I get my math abilities from. Um, and um, I always say my dad, but my dad didn't graduate high school. Um, but if you play cards with my dad, you'll quickly see where his math ability and how he thinks about math problems and solves them. And that it, it's really about a problem solving process, not about just having things memorized. Um, so, um, yeah, so like in your, so, now making some of these connections to our classrooms, um, you know, what are we seeing in our classroom, our grade level, our course level, our department, and our building? Um, and thinking about how do these support a reduction in math anxiety? And how do these help students see themselves as thinkers and problem solvers? During this breakout room time, if you, if you, if you need to, you can also talk about maybe how can we adjust some of these practices for a better alignment so that we support students as thinkers and problem solvers and allowing them to see themselves as mathematicians. So I will um, put that question um, in the chat right now for everybody to access, and we can go to breakout rooms for uh, 10 minutes, please, and answer those questions. All right, and while Carrie's putting that in the chat, um, I'll wait for that. Uh, one thing I, I'm just reflecting on as you folks go into that breakout session is how culturally we have we we have uh, approached this this question uh, with our students, you know, problem solver versus uh, speed and accuracy, you know, and, and I'm just I will be curious what types of conversations you have, because there's things that we always want to do that we feel like we're doing. But however, our cultural our cultural inclinations sometimes uh, over override uh, maybe what we what we maybe think we, we're doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that room here and uh, we'll see you back here to 637. We'll be back at 647 and off you go. All right, well, welcome back. I, I hope everybody had the chance to have some good conversations. Um, I just want to uh, take a moment and see if anybody would like to share um, a practice that they that they were really excited about or something that they thought they could change um, or, or just a discussion that you had that was like an aha that you're like, yeah, 
this is something that I hadn't thought of before. All right, we're practicing the uncomfortable wait time that you do on a Zoom call. I'll go ahead and go. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Um, so my district, um, we're starting a new program again. Um, so it's um, it's through this website. It's called SIS for Teachers, sis.org. I don't know if you ever heard of it, Strategies and Solutions. It's a lot of hands-on um, things, and so, uh, so which is great. So one of the things... Um, is the strategy so this lady who has this website she's got all these little um these little stuffed animals that are all a different strategy for attacking problems and one of them is called springling it's like this little stuffed animal it's got a tail it's like a springling or whatever and it's to help with subtraction um with the regrouping so instead of like and i just drew this for my my my, uh, my group so what you do is you you make an open number line so if you're going to do like 93 minus 67, so you've got some regrouping to do there. So instead of stacking the numbers traditional, you just draw an open number line and you start at 67 and you end at 93. And the students, what they do is they make hops um, all the way to 93. And you want to hop to decade numbers, which are multiples of 10 or um, century numbers, which are multiples of 100, depending on the problem. And it's kind of cool because all students will kind of figure out their own way. So like this one, you know, the kid would, they would hop from 67 to 70. Um, and that would be like a plus three. They keep track of their hops. And then um, for the next part, some kids might go from 70 to 80, 80 to 90. But then I've had students go right from 70 to 90 so they can do what's comfortable for them. And then they would go from 90 to 93. And then they would just add up, you know, the amount of each hop and then they have their answer. So that's, that's pretty cool um, and pretty cool strategy. And the students are starting to do that in their heads, which is really cool. So that's what they're kind of going towards. So there's all these different strategies that with this program that we're, you know, going through with the kids to kind of get that flexible thinking going on. So, you know, and one of the things that, I mean, that sounds the open number line really cool, but one of the things you talked about was how all the students did it differently. And they can, and students being able to see the way that each other solves the problem. And if I'm doing a hop of 10, and then I see somebody do a hop of 30, all of a sudden I can build off of that student's thinking and it, it gives me the chance to, to make sense of things in a very, you know, safe, um, you know, making sense of the things the way my peers do. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, we do like, and to do that, we do like, it's called a number talk. And so we demonstrate that. And then you collect answers, um, any kind of answer, and then you start even maybe with the wrong answer, and um, and then they talk about how they got it. And sometimes when they just talk about how they got it, they're like, "Oh, wait, hold on, let me change that," you know, because they're talking through it, and it wor it's working really well. So it's pretty cool. Yep, and that ability to um, value a shift in thinking, like you can change your mind while you're working on something, is really important um, as well. So thank you. All right, so um, Desiree, I, I bet you other people have other things to say because I actually have waited for the uncomfortable amount of time, but I'm gonna let Desiree take it over because she's got other things to share. All right, so this is kind of like a, a really great segue into this last part because we were just talking about different representations and really thinking about um, it's the communication piece and the process, not necessarily the final answer that um, is something that we can emphasize and value. So this is a, um, a high yield routine called which one doesn't belong. So this is just gonna be a quiet um, in your mind reflection. And the idea here is that you have a variety of options and it's not about a right answer. There's no one right answer. It's about your um, building your argument for which one A, B, C, or D that you believe um, does not belong with the other options. So I'm gonna give you a minute on the clock just to think in your mind.
All right. So is there anyone that's like, it's burning and you just really, really have to share? I can't really see. Oh, Chad, Chad, your hand is up. You're burning to share. Okay, this, I'm sorry, this is such an interesting prompt, right? Okay, so I'll just try this one. Uh, I have a couple, but I'll just say the uh, three times 15 doesn't, uh, three times five equals 15 doesn't belong uh, because, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the four times five equals 20 doesn't belong because all the others involve multiples of three. All right, thank you. And somebody else might be thinking that or some like, I didn't think that at all. Like I wasn't, that wasn't in my frame of reference when I was, um, when I was thinking about this, but it doesn't mean that one is right or one is wrong. Um, the point is to, to spark that conversation um, and to, to have a more personalized experience. And so now we're gonna, we're going to take this idea and um, adapt it a little, oh, nope, don't want that, adapt it a little bit. So it's still, which one doesn't belong? But now you see, we don't have um, numbers or equations. We have some descriptors. So same thing. Uh, one minute to think about this prompt. All right, so same prompt, but you might have had a very different like internal conflict. I know that I do when I look at this and thinking about um, why not all, like why um, it kind of like forces you, the prompt forces you to pick one or to, to potentially exclude one. And so I just wanna say first this, which one doesn't belong is a fantastic routine. So we're not trying to criticize the routine at all. Um, we're just trying to, to help emphasize the idea that sometimes when we're in a, a classroom and just, just how, um, how certain things have been set up potentially, or um, maybe even our worldview and how we've grown up, we might be more inclined to, to pick and choose, maybe even implicitly to think about like which, which person or which identity might not belong in mathematics space. And um, so maybe trying to reframe that to think about they all belong in the mathematics space so that we have, um, we have wonderful mathematicians that we might not necessarily think belong or, or haven't traditionally belonged, but we're here to, um, to try to reframe our thinking and to think about when, when we are um, exploring and building up students that all of their all of their identities belong in that mathematics space. So anyone know who this is? Hidden figures, right? Hey, yes, 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 yes. So yeah, so hidden figures. Yes. All right. So if anybody's familiar with the um, with the movie. All right. I haven't so, seen it. Highly recommend it. Okay. All right. So just um, so just keeping that in mind that we might not consciously dismiss certain identities, but once we're more aware of it, we can more intentionally uh, believe that everybody belongs in the mathematics space. And so thinking about how can we provide those opportunities so that all of the identities are brought in and that those and that we're using those to help 
build positive math identities. And so this whole session is about utilizing student identity. So let's define mathematics identity. So there's this book by um, NCTM, which is the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, and it's called The Impact of Identity in K through eight mathematics. And we're gonna use this to help build our definition of uh, math identity. So first it's a view of oneself as a doer, a knower, and a sense maker of mathematics. It's a deeply held belief about one's own ability to engage successfully with mathematics. And this is, it says K through eight, but this is a, no matter what your age, this is a, a working definition of mathematics identity. It's shaped by children's mathematics learning experiences and interactions with peers and adults. And uh, it's affected by beliefs about the nature of mathematics and the learning of mathematics. So a lot about your own beliefs and really getting into why, uh, why you're doing what you're doing and or why you're not doing something. All right, so how can we use this to, um, to build and affirm identities? So we're thinking about student-centered learning experiences and that any opportunity that we provide for students, we want that to deepen their mathematical understanding and we want, we want to increase that, but also we want to have experiences that are gonna help them get to know themselves and help them get to know the world around them and their peers and things, we want experiences that are going to affirm their identity and, and, and help them know that they are, it, help the, it helps them build agency. So, all right. So now we have some pictures that are popping up and what we want you to do in your mind is just think of one child or one um, teenager that's in your life or somebody that's in your, or a student in your classroom, just to, to help ground this experience. And so as you're thinking about that, that child or that teenager, how might their identity be affected by the experience of their current teacher or their future teachers? And how might, it be, how might their identity be impacted by the experiences that are being provided? All right, so I hope you have somebody in mind and you're gonna keep them in your mind. Um, so my person is in this lower left-hand corner and the same little guy in the upper right-hand corner, that's my, my nephew who's in kindergarten. So I'm thinking about how creative he is and how, like, how he loves to draw, how he loves to experiment. And I'm hoping that uh, his teacher and his current teacher and future teachers will bring those parts of his identity into the experiences that he has. All right, so now we're getting into this idea, still thinking about math identity and some ways to build in um, experiences for kids are to get to know your students and to build on their funds of knowledge. And so funds of knowledge might be a new idea for us. It's basically just taking, just getting to know your students and thinking about their interests, thinking about their home life, thinking about their, um, their first language, because it, it might not be English, thinking about their culture and how can we bring all of that into the classroom and so that they don't feel like they have to hide those pieces of themselves to, um, to finish an assignment. All right, so yeah, so skills, they're the skills because we know that our students are brilliant and they have so many different backgrounds and experiences. So how can we build upon those so that we have authentic experiences in the classroom? And so we can still bring in uh, all the math learning that we need and still bring in the standards, but how can we make our classroom so that 
students know that they are the most important part, not whatever standard we might have um, have to write on the board to say that this is what we're teaching for the day. All right, so we have another activity for you. You're gonna be in breakout rooms. And so this is a, it's gonna be on Jamboard. So when you're in your group, just one person um, log on to the Jamboard. And then if you could share your screen, that will cut down on, um, on the lag in the Jamboard. But we have an activity where you're just gonna have, you have six sticky notes in the middle and you're just thinking about which of these are more likely to access students' funds of knowledge. So to build, to bring in their artistic ability and their, um, their verbal and lingual ability. And so that we know that it's more about, um, it's not just about speed or accuracy. And so you can actually, I gave you editing rights, so you can actually move those sticky notes around. And I think we're ready for breakout rooms. Can you go ahead and uh, put that link in the chat, uh, Desiree? Yeah. And just pay attention to what room number you are, and that's the slide you'll go on to. Oh, yes. Thank you. So while we're waiting for that link, uh, once that link goes in the chat, go ahead. Yep, there it is. Go ahead and click on that. And uh, remember that the room number that you are going into corresponds to the Jamboard uh, room number you see right up there in the top left that you will be interacting in with your group and how many minutes now uh, Desiree? Um, let's do like six minutes. Six minutes it is. All right, so hopefully everybody has clicked on that link click 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 on that link and you will be going into that room in three click on that link two. click on that link one off you go. <laughs> There's so, so many things like, I know how to work that sticky note now. Right, right. I'm going to change the color. Uh, I have a question about Jamboard. So um, we don't use Google Classroom. We use um, for Microsoft School. But how many, how many participants can you have in a Jamboard? Is it unlimited? I think it's a hundred in, at one time. 100 okay that that's if they don't have but if i have a classroom i think I can, I, the max i can have is 25. they can all be in the jam board at one time if you have 25 kids yeah right right but i can't have more than 25. i think if you, if you set up a classroom oh yeah i don't know i'm i i haven't you i haven't used jamboard with google classroom per se but i know um it works it does work better if you have um, kids in groups and just one person shares like we did here, because another reason for that is because it's a max of 20 frames. Oh, okay. So, um, so it just works better with like loading things and then um, group work. Okay. But yeah, but yeah, it's a pretty cool tool. And I see that yeah. you all, um, you all were moving those sticky notes. So thank you for that. And I saw um, a few groups were adding some additional um, options. So thank you for that as well. So this is just uh, just to give us an idea of less likely, more likely. There are no absolutes, of course, but just um, items that are more likely to access funds of knowledge include those student por portfolios, community-based problems, multiple representations. And I know at least one group added in project based instruction to, to, to help bring in um, other pieces or uh, multiple identities into the math room. So thank you for that. Um, so then just thinking, so here's, here's just an example of uh, multiple representations and how we can, if the more pieces of someone's identity are being expressed in an experience, then the more representations we're going to have and the more creativity and the more diversity of thought we're going to have. So this is just an example of that. So um, maybe somebody's really into um, baseball or sports so that so you have that um, 
that additional access with um, the let's play ball package. And then somebody sees, then you're doing, you're actually doing the math and you're working with partners and then some people see it graphically. So then you, you can use, you can bring in some technology. Maybe, maybe there's some kids in your class that are, are really, really good at using computer. So you can bring in those aspects and, um, and have a graphical answer. And then there are other people who really like sticky notes and really like, like writing out things. So it's um, instead of limiting children to or students to one, um, one answer or one way of doing things, we're thinking about how can we expand that and how many, how, how many different ways could we have? And then we can get more into math practices and making using those representations and making connections between those representations to deepen everyone's understanding and to get into different definitions of knowing that we were talking about at the beginning of um, before we got started. So just like different different ways of seeing the world too. So, um, and then here is just another example. And uh, so this is from, um, from elementary. So earlier in the presentation, we were talking, when you all were in breakout groups, you were talking about um, different games and just different ways to, um, to adapt a task so you don't have that pressure of time. And that so in the, the anxiety is lowered when you can express more about yourself because it's more natural. It's like you're, you're just really living into who you are. So this is an example of on the left-hand side, it's you could have these as flashcards, you could have these um, as a time test or untimed test, but you could take that same activity and turn it into a game. So this on the right hand side is a game. Um, so it's, it's called treasure hunt or an, an adaptation of treasure hunt. So this is um, a screenshot from the Kentucky Mathematics Center. And this is a Google slide that they have adapted where um, you and a partner or up to four people, you're working cooperatively instead of against each other to try to find all the chocolate treasures that are underneath the hearts. And so it's either a treasure underneath the heart or you can move the heart to reveal a multiple of four. And if you reveal a multiple of four, then you have to figure out where it goes, either a yellow multiple of four, multiple of four or a blue multiple, multiple of four. So, um, same idea, thinking about uh, multiplication in groups of four, but very different ways to approach that learning. And, all right, so just coming back to like full circle for us. So just thinking about how do we reduce anxiety in, um, in the math classroom and um, how do we how do we not provide like, more stressful opportunities for students, but instead um, support building positive math identities? So we've talked this we spent this time the session talking about some ways, and you shared some wonderful ways of um, of reducing that anxiety and and building and just seeing our students and um, seeing seeing our seeing them in. Um, their complete selves. So um, we know that like, you know, life isn't perfect. We've had a lot of stressors and um, students bring those stresses into the classroom and, but they also bring all of their strengths. And so how can we provide more ways so that they can see their strengths and so that they know that they are capable of doing, doing hard things and, um, and doing, doing this math that we're asking of them. So now we're going to send you back into a breakout room to think about this. This is your turn. So what are you committing to in the next month to, to, help, to help your students see themselves in the math classroom even more than they already are? And what are you committing to in the next month to help reduce math anxiety? All right. And so again, you'll be uh, off you go. I'm going to add a little bit of twist on this because I know that this is one of those things that impacts our ability to accomplish these very, very things that we want to do. And so as you're as you're uh, uh, considering these prompts, you know, thinking about how you can provide these opportunities. 
if if some if some folks in your group can also help us as a group understand the ways that you are practically assessing or grading those things because often it is those impediments that keep us from implementing some of these strategies uh, that can build positive identities and so forth and so from a practical standpoint as educators we gotta get stuff in the grade book so how can we do this good stuff and accomplish those practical things that we need to to do to represent our our classroom efficacy so i hope you don't mind that i did that desiree i just I, you know what can i i can't help myself so off you go uh, how many minutes desiree um how about if we do like seven minutes seven minutes i love i love the just the, the like the the off you know non like you know yeah. i love that way of thinking all right seven minutes okay. it is right. okay so, and I will put this prompt back in the uh, breakout rooms when you get there, so you'll see it again. All right, off you go, and see you back in seven minutes. In more seconds, it's so interesting. You know, there's math, it's just one of those subjects that just produces so much angst, right? I mean, I don't know if anybody's stressing out, you know, over their social studies, you know, work, you know, or, you know, maybe English, you know, is another one, you know, but I, I think math just, you know, is on a different level. We're here to change that. There it is, and they're all back. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so welcome back. And so, you were talking about something that you're committing to in the next. And, oh, whoa. Sorry. Um, and so, if there's anybody who wants to like unmute, share, or if you wouldn't mind just like typing in the chat because the, the more we talk about it, the more we write about it, like Chad was saying earlier, like the, the more willing or the, the more it's gonna be in our brain and on our mind to, um, to actually complete. So either in the chat, one thing that you're committing to or feel free to unmute or unmute. I like Nicole's comment uh, to incorporate more games, you know, what's wrong with fun? Yes, yes. And the, the, the more positive experiences you have, they, they you're going to remember that. Um, and it's not about the winning, but about um, you can incorporate all those strategies, use more exit tickets as many assessment. Thanks. Good, good. That's the kind of stuff that I think is really important for us as educators. Like, you know, we have workload, we have workflow, and it's like, how are we, how can we get this stuff done in a practical way with 30 kids, or in my case, 120 over six periods? Yeah, and limiting, limiting the problem. Because if you can, if you can figure out a student's thinking with two problems, then why are you giving them 15? Ooh. Man, math teachers got it easy again. Dang it. All English teachers are like, ah. Oh. <laughs> so I asked students to investigate and think about how math is involved. Oh, in a hobby of theirs, they're building in more identity. I like that. Culture of support, try new things. These are great. Thank you. Group activities, yes. Because I mean, what kids thing? like to talk anyway. So like, get them together, keep them together, and um, give them give them a prompt to to talk about. Um, nice. Thank you. All right. So even if you didn't have a chance to to type it in the chat, I hope that you had the chance just to start thinking about it. Um, what you're going to commit to and just know, I think um, like we're, we're here, like this is um, a group effort <laughs> too. So if I know like, it, like speaking for myself, I guess like if you ever want to brainstorm ideas, like I'm, I'm here and um, we're in this together. So thank you. Oh, I like questions with more than one right answer. Yes, for sure. All right, and um, that's pretty much the end of our presentation. Thank you all so much for being here with us.
And I don't know if anybody has questions. I guess we have time for questions, right, Chad? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. It is 728. And so um, if you have some some questions that you would like to pose to our facilitators, uh, please hang out. Um, I just want to thank you all for joining us here this evening. Um, this was a really fascinating uh, kind of a, a topic. It delves into culture, delves into, you know, personal uh, kind of like uh, personal identity and, 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 and helps us think about our own blind spots and helps us to think about ways to encourage students, um, you know, in ways that even we can't think about, right? I mean, we only know life through our own, you know, senses, right? Uh, but uh, it's great to, to practice ways to, to get outside of ourselves uh, to help our students uh, be successful. Um, I would just remind folks that you will get an email um, after this session uh, that will have uh, this presentation as well as all those links. So you saw those books. If, if your bookshelf was looking a little bare, uh, we're going to have some links for you to, to get some books. And, uh, and of course, uh, we have uh, sessions coming up. And uh, the next session coming up in, the, in this series, um, let's see here, is going to be a really good one. It's on um, connection before curriculum, the social and emotional learning for students and staff. So I think that's going to be a great one. That is a great kind of like a dovetail for, for this kind of uh, session that talks about, you know, how can we connect with the student experience? Because the more that we do that, the more successful they will be at learning, right? And so uh, building those connections uh, in, in terms of identity, uh, as well as, you know, our SEL uh, approach, you know, in this uh, era where we're being pressured to close the learning gap, I think that's a bunch of hooey. Uh, but we do need to make those connections to close the learning gap such that it exists, right? First things first. So thank you all. It is 7.30. If you want to hang out, please do. Other than that, uh, go get something to eat. Thank you for joining us, Lisa. Jennifer, thank you for the contributions. Nicole, thank you so much. Vishan, always nice to see you. Uh, Phil, good to see you in there, too. Thank you so much. Angela, Lori, Cassiopeia, that is a great name. Thank you for joining us. Lee Fang, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. All right. Have a good night. Julie, have a good night. Mary, thank you for joining us. Melissa, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, where are you coming at? Where are you from? Where are you at, right now, Melissa? Where are you at? Right now, where am I at? Yes, you're on your I'm couch. I can see that. Huh? I, I'm my I, I live in Clawson, but I teach in Redford. Okay, that's somewhere where I have no idea. Is that like Detroit area? Yep, generally? yep, yep, sort of. Okay. Yep. You're my Do neighbor. Make... I'm in Berkeley. Oh, is that right? okay. Do they make pickles in Clawson? Yeah. Okay. That, that was just, that was my best. That was all I could, that was my best. right Spelled there. differently. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Did you have any questions uh, that we can uh, answer for you, Melissa? Well, I do teach pre-algebra, so I would like some maybe games. I'd like to incorporate some more games um, that would be appropriate. I, I looked at, at the Kentucky website. That's what I was doing when you called me out, Chad. Um, it looks a little too low, a little too low for uh, my kiddos, but um, there was a link and I, I clicked on the algebra one for resources, but um, math yeah. playground is a great site was for some games Okay. for, I used to teach middle school. So yeah, math playground is a good one. You know, and Melissa, what I would say about the, cause I'm middle school as well, is that the Kentucky math they are definitely geared towards elementary, but it, you can take that structure and change it to be your content. And, you know, sometimes the middle school kids actually appreciate the, the fun Valentine's pictures, but, um, but definitely if you think of your content, you can kind of steal the, the setup and then just change the numbers kind of a thing. Yeah. So I um, actually, I teach pre-algebra for um, at, at the high school for special ed students. Okay. So yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I definitely have come to appreciate, uh, learn and appreciate the idea that it doesn't matter how old or what grade the kids are in, like they love all that goofy game stuff they, and sticker, stickers. Oh, they do. They that. totally do. Really? And I have mostly boys and, you know, they still like playing their little toys. <laughs> Things it, it, like it, that. It, I'm 48. I still, <laughs> still playing, still playing. Okay, doesn't, doesn't good. Change. All right. Well, thank you so much, Melissa, for joining us. Um, and uh, hey, Colleen, Carrie, Desiree, that was great. Thank you so much. I could tell that you guys really uh, 
uh, we're, we're I, I see some some additional technique in there. So I really appreciate the work that you guys doing uh, for these sessions. Thank you so much. See you next week. Thank see you. you. Bye. Next time when you come back, Desiree, I want to know, like, we need to know, like, the mysteries of knowledge. You, you, <laughs> you, you have to unlock that. Okay? All right. I'll have all the answers next week. <laughs> all of truth and knowledge must be revealed. Okay. All right. All right. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.